All right, good morning. So we're in week two of this series uh, called Align, and it's positioning our lives so that we can walk in God's fullness. And where this comes from is in the book of Matthew, uh, Jesus has these seven first statements that he makes sprinkled throughout the entire book. And when we see those, recognize them, and we begin to take them to heart and implement them in our lives, what happens is we begin to get in alignment with God. We get in alignment with His Word. And what happens is there's power that comes out of that and blessing that comes out of that. And so last week, we looked at this statement that Jesus made when the Pharisees came to him. And they said, hey, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and everything else, the law and the prophets, hinges on this. So we said last week that everything starts in the hearts. Everything starts in the heart. So the, that word heart is mentioned 800 times in the Bible, because Jesus was really concerned about our hearts. And so this morning, we're going to look at this other powerful first that Jesus mentioned in Matthew 6, where he is, again, doing the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, chapter... So all of chapter 6 is Jesus' words, every single one. So the entire chapter is just Jesus' words. And Jesus is starting out here, and he's sharing about some things that are important. He's, he's going to talk about prayer and fasting and money and anxiety and worry. And essentially what he's doing, and this is what I want you guys to grab a hold of this morning, right off the get-go, this phrase is, he is wanting to give them a upgrade. He's wanting to give them an upgrade. Because any time we prefer and we seek God and we trust God, the result is an upgrade. So Jesus is talking here in this Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about all this, these things and he's essentially dealing with some big things. He's dealing with hypocrisy. Right? He's talking about, hey, religious people, and they kind of do the prayer so they can be seen and be seen as spiritual and these things. He's dealing with motivations all through chapter 6. And then he's also dealing with, with values, what's valuable, or as we would call it this morning, priorities. Because he's going to talk about aligning not just our hearts, but aligning our priorities to seek something. So he's coming through and he's working down and he comes to, and you'll see it on your screen, he comes to verse 25 and he had just talked about money and he says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? He's He's dealing with these things because these were things that were important and priorities to people. But they also can have the potential to actually take first place. So he goes on to say, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not much more valuable? Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? He goes on to say, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. 
If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So don't worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. And now he's going to drop this really famous passage of scripture right into the midst of this context. He says, pagans run after these things. Your heavenly father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So Jesus is giving us another first here. He's saying, seek ye first the kingdom. That word first that's used there means in order, sequence, value, affinity, and affection. So seeking it first means it is not only in our heart of, okay, hey, this is the most valuable thing. This is really what I'm going after. But I'm also intentionally putting this first in my life. But God always wants to give us an upgrade. And we're going to look at the end here. We're going to look at a guy named David and some, this powerful statement that's said about him because he sought the kingdom of God first. But we're going to define this here. So how does this play out in real life? I was playing in the NBA. I had played one year. A teammate of mine had shared with me about Christ. I saw something different in his life. I, I truly did. I saw a peace. I saw a, an authentic relationship with God. We would be on the road. He would share things with me. And at the end of that season in June of 1991, he said, hey, I've been watching you this year. I think you know about God. I, I don't think you actually have a relationship with Jesus. And I didn't. And he said, hey, there's a pastor friend of mine that I want you to meet. And he introduced me to this guy and, and he shared with me the good news of, of Christ. That he died for me, that I could have forgiveness, that I could have cleansing, that he would come dwell in me. He would give me power. He had a purpose for my life on this, on this planet, but also that I could have eternity with him, that I could be with him forever. And he's sharing this with me. And I've already got everything that I wanted, supposedly, in life. I'm like, okay, I got this MBA, and I got this money, and I got this car, and I got this clothes. You got to understand, I used to walk through the mall it, it, where I grew up in Akron, Ohio. And we had this mall that we would go to, which was for poorer people, Chapel Hill Mall. And then there was another mall called, called Summit Mall that had the real stores, like Chapel Hill Mall had Spencer's, okay? Summit Mall had like Nordstrom's. And we only got to go to like Summit Mall because it was about 30, 35 minutes away. We only got to go to Summit Mall like once a year. And I remember walking through and when I was a kid and, and you know, we didn't have a lot of money. My, I, my mom was a single mom. My mom was a teacher. My mom worked incredibly hard. I think my mom probably when I was growing up was making like $18,000 a year teaching. And uh, so we didn't have a lot. I remember one time for real, she, she asked me what I wanted on my birthday. And I said, I wanted to go see the Cleveland Indians play the Kansas City Royals because I love the Royals. She got enough change out of a little canister next to our phone where pencils were, emptied it out of the couch, out of the ashtray in her, our car that needed jumped every morning. My uncle would come over and jump us the battery so she could drive to work. She rallied up about $9.13. She put $2 in the gas, drove to Cleveland. We bought $1 outfield tickets and park for one dollar and I got a hot dog or something and so for nine she took me and let me see this 
So we would walk through Summit Mall, and I would see the polo section. And I could never have it. The polo shirts, like that was what area. I had JCPenney. And I'd see the polo shirts. And then we could never buy them because they were like too expensive. I don't think I ever owned one. And I remember when I made it, I went in and I bought every color. She couldn't witness to it. She's like, hey, Dave, most of these colors don't look good on you. Yellow doesn't look good on you. Pink doesn't look good on you. Baby blue doesn't look good on you. But the thing was, is the point I'm getting after is, man, it was like all these things are going to fulfill me. If I get this and this and this and this. And you, and you get all that. And then you're like, hey, that's not it. And so I give my life to Christ and he changes me. And literally, I'm in the word and like a week later, I'm sitting there and I'm like, God, but I want a wife. And I'm going to church services and I'm watching and I'm going, maybe that person on the worship team. Maybe that's her. And I would be, you know, someplace and it's like, oh, maybe it's her, maybe it's her. And God spoke to me one day. He said, Dave, if you will seek me first, seek first my kingdom, I have a daughter of mine for you, and she will be holy, and she will love me, she will love you, she will be faithful, she will love your children, and you will walk in a blessed relationship. And he goes, don't mess it up. He didn't say it like that. That's my interpretation. But I got the distinct sense, you know what? Let me just seek first the kingdom. I didn't know it at the time that God was working on April in California. That she had reached rock bottom, that a a co-worker of hers had been praying for her and invited her to a church, Hope Chapel, Hermosa Beach. She blew her off for weeks and weeks and weeks. Finally went and the pastor's preaching, Zach Nazaria preaching, and April comes running down in her Bob Marley shirt and black high top speckled tennis shoes and gives her life to the Lord. When I talked later to her, she said, you know, my dad had always said to me, never put all your eggs in one basket. And when I went down that day, she said, Jesus, I'm putting my eggs, all of them in your basket. <laughs> Golf clap. Two, two claps. <laughs> now, the point is, guys, it's always an upgrade. It's always an upgrade. Seek first the kingdom. And all these other things, Jesus said, will be added unto you. You put anything you want in there. And God, he always has an upgrade. So let's look at this. So he says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, all these things. So what is the kingdom? That's what I asked again this week as I was studying. So what is the kingdom? Well, the kingdom, ironically, is just where God's rule and reign is. So you have to understand that the kingdom of God is always, it's present, and it's yet future. So it's always, God is sovereign. Everything that's happening, God is sovereign. There's nothing that surprises God. God is outside of time. He is the author and perfecter of faith. His plans are being worked out. We did a series years ago on the book of Daniel, and Daniel is getting these revelations of all these things that are going to happen, these kingdoms that are going to come and fall, and this kingdom's going to arise. And da-da. God just showed him a glimpse of what he was going to do in history. So God, the kingdom of God, God's rule and reign, is, is, is always. But what happened, what we have to understand, is that God was sovereignly working through Adam and Eve and had placed them in the garden and told them to rule and to reign, to tend the garden, and they gave over their authority to the enemy, to the devil. And what happened is he has been working, trying to establish his kingdom in our hearts 
our families, our schools, our communities. He is at work. He, he was always trying to build his kingdom, the, the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of man. Then Jesus shows up on the scene, and Jesus, 126 times in the Gospels, talks about the kingdom. Hey, I'm ushering in a new kingdom. This, there's, my kingdom is being established. So the kingdom is real, but invisible. It's very real, what's, what's happening around us. And yet, it's also future in terms of God will one day ultimately put an end to all rule and all reign, and everything will be consummated. Golf clap, thank you. So, this thing of what is the kingdom? It's the central message and teaching of Jesus. It is literally wherever God's rule and reign is and God primarily wants to work first and foremost in our hearts so whenever a person asks Jesus to come in to be Lord of their life saying come in Jesus rule and reign here rule and reign in in my life then God's kingdom begins to get established and then when he gets a group of people called a church. He begins to work through a group of people who are called to represent and manifest his kingdom into the world. Now, his kingdom is different. His kingdom, in the book of James, it says, hey, wherever you find disorder and strife and dissension and, and bitterness and these things, it's always earthly, sensual, demonic. But wherever you find peace Wherever you find humility, yield, this is the kingdom of God. Another place the Bible says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So God's kingdom is completely different. There's order in God's kingdom, not disorder. There's peace in God's kingdom. There's joy in God's kingdom. There's love in God's kingdom. There's deference in God's kingdom. So he's telling us that we're to seek first his kingdom. So what does that practically look like? Practically. Well, I just did five H's this morning. Five H's for what this thing looks like. So here's the first one. Where's, where's his kingdom? In our hearts. When we say, Jesus, come in and be Lord of my life. Come in right here. I, I want to seek your kingdom here. I want your kingdom to abide here in my life, in my heart. Second, in our homes. What does it look like to say, God, I'm going to prefer your kingdom in my home. What does that look like? Well, sometimes it's practical. Sometimes it's as I was trying to follow the Lord, as we were newly married and have, had kids, and all of a sudden I'd say, okay, God, what does this look like in my home? Okay, what this looks like in your home is... Prefer your wife. God, how can I honor and glorify you here? Not seeking my own will. Not seeking God's selfishness. Okay, God, what does it look like to seek first your kingdom here in my home? God, what it looks like is loving your kids. What it looks like is being forgiving. What it looks like is being patient. What it looks like is taking the time when you're tired at night and you've worked all day and it's nine o'clock and you, and you go, you know what, I'm going to go spend some time with my kids and I'm going to sit, 
talk with them and listen to them and ask them how their day went. I'm going to talk to them about Jesus, and I'm going to talk to them about the Bible. That's seeking first the kingdom in our homes. And then what does it look like? And I just had to really work to get this one. What does this look like in our handiwork? What does this look like in our work to seek first the kingdom? Okay, God, you have me here at this place. God, how do I honor you? How do I glorify you? God, how do I make your name known? God, I don't want to just be selfish with what you've given me. And I'm just here, God, and I'm just, a, you know, on Sunday I worship. No. What does it look like? Because the Bible says, do everything that you, everything as unto the Lord. So what, is it, what does it look like to seek first his kingdom at work? Well, it means being honest on expense reports. It means putting in a full day's wage and not cheating your boss. It means how you respond when everybody else is gossiping. How do you, how do you live in the midst of that? It's essentially saying, seeking first the kingdom is essentially saying, God, how do I, how do I represent you? How do I honor you? How do I prefer you? Wherever you have me. Then with our hobbies. So our hearts, our homes, our handiwork, our hobbies. How do we seek the, first the kingdom and the things you've given us that are enjoyable to do? This week I was talking to one of our leaders here at Renovate. And he was sharing, you know, hey, I have a hobby and I... I like to go and, and, and do this. And I was there and God moved on my heart. There was a, a person that worked there. And God moved on my heart because I'd heard that they were going through some medical things and so forth. And I'm there enjoying what I enjoy to do, whether that's Orange Theory or whatever. And I heard that this person was going through medical things and I went home and I asked my wife, I feel like we should help them. And we came to an agreement to help. It was $1,500. And I went in and I got the boss of the business and I said, I know that one of your workers is going through a really hard time. My wife and I just want to bless their family with this. And gave it to them. And this individual the next day called our leader into the office at this business establishment and said, I want you to watch the cameras. When I gave this to them, he began to weep and, and cry. This, this is taking a hobby and seeking first the kingdom. God, what do you want to do here? How do you want to manifest your goodness. How do you want to manifest your presence? How do you want to manifest your love? How do you want to manifest here? And then last, not only just in our hearts and our homes and our handiwork and our hobbies, but into humanity. God, how can I seek first your kingdom? I was sitting in Indianapolis one day. I picked up a book at Barnes & Noble a professor from Penn State University had written it called The Coming of Global Christianity, The Next Christendom. It was a very technical book, and I'm reading it. And he's talking about revival that's going on all over the world in the Southern Hemisphere and South America. And they estimate about 150 million Chinese have come to Christ in the last 40 years, and revivals happening in different places. And he mentions a place. He says, you know, many times the best thing we can do as Americans is to go and help places where revival are happening by resourcing them and giving them leadership training. And he mentions a place that's the poorest country on the planet called Sierra Leone. I had never even heard of Sierra Leone. 
Sierra Leone? What? So I start Googling it. God begins to speak to me truly in my office. You're going to go to Sierra Leone. I'm not lying. I get a phone call five minutes later from a pastor friend of mine who said, Hey, Dave, Sierra Leone has just opened up after the blood diamond, the wars, the civil war, all this. We're going to be taking teams in to preach the gospel. And I said, I'm supposed to go. And we flew to Freetown, Sierra Leone. And we had three strikes against us. They don't like Americans. They're Muslim majority. And they really don't like white people. And I'm American, Christian, and I'm white. And we go. And we begin to preach in different places. And lives begin to get healed and changed in this and we worked with a pastor there pastor Shadonke Johnson who lost a son in the civil war and he stayed most pastors left and he stayed and I really I believe from the time that we were there he's planted a thousand churches in Sierra Leone what does it look like to say God I want to seek first your kingdom in my heart in my home, in my work, in my hobbies, and in humanity. If you'll, I'm telling you, if you'll seek first his kingdom, and I'm ending here, look at this passage of scripture about King David. David's one, my name's Dave, John David. It's called David from the time, my dad's name is John David as well. David's my favorite Bible character. I just love everything about him. As you know, David as a young man preferred God. Preferred God's kingdom. It's costly at times. It's controversial at times. But he always preferred God's kingdom. God, what do you want to do? How do you want to use me? Oh, there's a giant taunting the armies of the living God. Here I am, God. Oh, God, you just want worship out in the field? Here I am. God, what do you want? And he comes to this place. And this woman named Abigail, her husband is very insolent, and he's cursing David and doing all this stuff. And she comes out to meet David, and she says, hey, my husband's a fool. And she begins to speak something to him. And look at what it says in 1 Samuel 25, 28 through 30. Abigail says, Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty. That's a powerful word. For my Lord, because you fight the Lord's battles. David had oriented his life to say, God, you care about this place, you care about this nation, you care about people, you care about the world. Okay, God, with everything I have, how can I serve it? And God says back to him, I will make you a lasting dynasty because you fight the Lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel. Jesus says, seek first. Not promotion. Him, he brings promotion. Not money. Seek him first. Seek his kingdom first and all these other things 
He doesn't lie. He's never failed. When I said, God, I'm seeking you first. In June of 1991, in my apartment in Houston, across from Astro World, and I'm going to L.A. to play in the L.A. Summer League with the Rockets. And I said, God, I'm going to give April a call. And he said, no, it's not the right time. Seek my kingdom first. Seek my kingdom first. Okay. I get home from the L.A. Summer League. I go on vacation with my family to North Carolina. I get back from North Carolina. I get home. I got 37 Messages on my answer machine. Let me listen to them. Beep. 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 Hey, Dave, this is April. I just want to wish you a happy birthday, and if you get a chance sometime, give me a call. Lord, can I call? Yep. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing good. You must have got a great job. I have some really good news for you. I have really good news for you. You go first. Mine's really good. No, 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 no. You go first. Mine's really good. I just wanted to tell you that Jesus is real, and I gave my heart to Jesus three weeks ago. And I said, I gave my life to Jesus in June. Four hours. God said, love her as a sister. Honor her. Da, 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 da. One day we're playing the Lakers. We have an off day the next day. I go to breakfast with April. We're having a great time. She drops me off at the LAX airport. I'm walking. I turn around to say goodbye. And God says, that's your wife. You are good. Seek first the kingdom. All these other things will be added to you. We'll have our worship team come back up. I'm going to pray. We're going to go out with a song. Go ahead and stand to your feet. God, thank you. You want to upgrade our lives. So much, your kingdom is so much better than anything else, any worldly thing, any worldly kingdom. Here at Renovate, we want to seek first your kingdom. We say we're available. We're willing. God, whatever you want to do. God, in Leander, in Cedar Park, in Austin, to the nation's God, we want in this place, we want to seek first your kingdom. Not a lifestyle, not possessions, not popularity, not accumulation. You, your kingdom. Help us to do that. Help us to put, put it first in affection and affinity and sequence and in all these other things will be given to us in Jesus' name.